Welcome to the Jungus Games tutorial for Brick and Mortar. In today's video, I'll be teaching you the rules to this game as we play through two complete rounds. Now, I would like to ask that if you end up enjoying this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel, you can do so by going to jungusgamescom support. Once you arrive there, you'll find a wide variety of ways in which you can help, and some of those come with cool bonuses, like voting on a few of the videos that I film each month. All right, let's jump into the game. Out here, the game is fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Before we move on, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. I might make mistakes as I am showing you the game, and that will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them. I would also like to mention that today I am filming with a prototype version of the game, so the art and components are not necessarily what you'll find in the final version. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Each player is in charge of their own storefront, and as we play through the game, we are going to be purchasing stores to fill these in. Now, we also might close down stores in order to get conditional victory points, or because we don't want to pay the utility fees for that store, because it's not profitable enough for us. Now, as we play through the game, we are going to be using the supply and demand cards in order to influence the amount of supplied resources and the public's demand for the resources that our shops are going to be selling. Now the goal of the game is to try and purchase these supplies for as low a price as possible and then sell the goods from our stores back to the public for as high a price as possible to be as profitable as we can. The problem is that we are doing this at the same time as our opponents, so they are going to be constantly trying to undercut our prices as we sell goods, and they also might be trying to overpay for the supplies, which means they make less profit, but they get the supplies whereas we might not. So we have to constantly be trying to figure out just how much we can spend in order to make the money that we need. Now that money is important because we are going to use it in order to purchase new buildings, pay the utility cost of the buildings that we already have, as well as purchase new supplies for future rounds to get the resources that we can then sell back to the public for hopefully a profit. The last reason we are trying to make money is potentially the most important reason, and that involves investing in ourselves in order to generate victory points. Now once the game is over, the player with the most points will be the winner, and every round we will have the ability to spend money in order to get these victory points, and there are various other ways to get points as we play through the game as well. Now the game itself is structured over an entire year, with each month being one round, and we are going to play through the game until we have gone through 12 rounds, which is one year, or until any one player has reached the victory point threshold on the track. At that point, we will calculate up the final scores, and the player with the most points will be the winner. Now I think at this point it's time to start playing the game, and today we are going to be playing as the blue player down here. Now technically, before the first round begins, each player is going to do a hand draft to figure out what cards they are going to have in their hand at the start of the game. Now the way this works is we are all given four random cards, and then we selected one, and then passed the rest over to the next player, and then took the cards from the player on our right, and then we selected another one until we had three cards in our hand. As I said, I took care of that off screen, so these are the three cards we will be starting off with, and I do want to mention that as part of setup, you can instead go with a preset hand for your first game, which will tell you exactly which store cards to have in your hand, as well as which of these supply and demand cards to have, instead of drawing these randomly, which is what you do in a standard version of the game. So let's focus over here where you can see we are currently in the month of January, and each month is split into seven overall phases. Now the first phase is building, and the building phase for January is different from the building phase for every other month in the game. The way it works in January is we are going to take these starting cards out and put them in front of us, and we are going to make sure to only have cards that match our player count. As you can see, these say 2 plus and 3 plus players, and this is a 3 player game, so we can make all of these available. And then in the player turn order, we can each take one of these starting buildings to be our first building on our storefront. Now we are at the top of this track, and I think we want to start off with building number 5, which will let us stock food as well as clothing. So we can place this here on the leftmost part of our storefront, and then as part of the January building phase, we are going to fill up our storefront by taking the associated goods equal to our capacity, and we put them on our top shelves. It's worth noting that you only fill this in in the month of January. In every subsequent month, whenever you put a new building onto your storefront, you do not add any cubes down onto it. Next up, Orange can pick, and they want to go with this one here, so that is going to have them starting off with four food. And finally, Orange can choose, and they are going to go with this building here, which lets them start off with four clothes. At this point, we can discard all of the remaining starting buildings back to the box, and we have finished January's building phase. 
That means it's time to move on to the next phase of the month, but I think what I'm actually going to do at this point is play through the rest of January off camera and then pick things up in the building phase for February where I can explain how the building phase works for the rest of the game. So with that in mind, let's jump ahead to the start of February. Well, here we are, and if we look at our current money reserve, we have $31, and we started the game with $15, so that means we got a profit of $16 over the course of that first month. Now, that went pretty well, but there wasn't a lot of competition in the first month, and we are going to start to see that now that we are into February. Now, before we start the February building phase off, I'd like to talk to you more about the turn order. As you can see, this has changed from January because we were in first and the orange player was in last place. Now they are now in first because the turn order track shows us the relative scores between the players. The player with the most points is going to go first and then second most is going to go second and so on between all of the players. But the turn order is only going to change if you ever gain more points than a player who is ahead of you on the track. That's why red is still behind us, even though we have the same score here. We bought one point, and then the red player did as well, so that uh, relative position between us did not change here. But the orange player bought two points, which means they have more points than anyone else, which means they are now going first. Now, the turn order track importance is going to vary based off of the round. Sometimes it is better to be in last place versus first place, and you can see there are some icons on top and bottom down here, and I'll explain how those relate to the turn order track when we get to each of those sections in the tutorial. All right, let's glance over here where we are indeed in February, and let's now take the first regular building phase of the game. Now, as you can see, the building icon looks like that. And that icon does show up here at the top of the turn order track, which means for the building phase, we are going to go from the first player to the second and third player in that order. So that means the orange player can go right now. This means they now have three options available to them. The first is they can start an auction for one of these public buildings over here. The second is they could just straight up buy a building from their hand of cards. And the third option is they can pass. Now the orange player has decided they would like to start an auction which means they have to select which of these four buildings they want to start that auction for. As you can see, these four are face up and there is a face up one on the top of the deck, but you can't start an auction for this. That just gives you an idea of what the next card will be. Now the orange player has decided to start an auction for the duty free store. And whenever you start an auction, the lowest starting bid has to match the price in the top corner. In this case, Orange decides to start with a minimum bid of $14, and if we look to the turn order track, we are next. Now that means we could outbid them by going to $15 or more if we wanted to, but if we won this auction, then this would be the building that we could construct in this building phase, and you can only add one building per overall building phase. Now I think we actually want to add this clothing importer from our hand, so we are going to pass on this so that we can do that later on in this phase. So now the red player can bid. Now they do like the idea of this duty free store, so they are going to bid a higher number and they're going to go with $16. Well, this means it's now back to the orange player and they could either pass or they could bid 17 or more dollars. Now they would really like this, so they are going to bid 17 and we can now see that we are next. Now we have already passed on this auction, so we cannot jump back in. So that means we can automatically move to the red player to see if they want to once again outbid the orange player. After thinking about it, Red decides they don't want to spend more than $17, so they are going to pass, and that means everyone but the Orange player has passed, and now Orange can spend the $17 that they need for that winning bid. Now, they do have that money over here, but it is worth noting that if they did not have enough money to pay for this, then they could take these debt tokens over here. Now, each debt token gives you $2, and it will lose you one victory point at the end of the game, and that is definitely not something players want to do if they can avoid it. As I said, Orange can easily cover this. They have a 20 here, and they spent 17, so they can take $3 back. After that, they have the option of adding this store onto their building front. Now, I say option because if they want to, they could not do that, in which case they would just return this to the box, which means they just spent money to remove this from the market, and that is definitely not a play that the Orange player wants to do right now. So they are going to add this to their storefront, and it must go into the leftmost empty spot. After that, the orange player does have the option of closing any businesses that they want to in front of them, and if they did that, they would simply discard that card back to the box, and some of the buildings actually generate various bonuses when they are closed, but in this case, the orange player is not going to do any of that. So their turn is done, and there is a hole here in the building market, so we can slide these down and reveal the next one on top of the deck. 
All right, it's now time for our building phase action. And as I mentioned during the orange player's turn, instead of starting an auction, I think we just want to construct a building from our hand. Now, these are the cards that we drafted as part of setup, and it's worth noting that there is no way in the game to add more cards into our hand. So that means once we build one of these out, we will have a smaller hand, and if we continue to construct all of these, we could go down to zero cards in hand, which means any future buildings we'd want to construct would have to be one at the auction. Now, the cost to add these to our storefront is the minimum auction bid in the top left. So in this case, we want to add the clothing importer, and that shows $10. So we can simply spend $10 and then put that into our leftmost spot in front of us. And once again, we could close a storefront if we wanted to, but I don't think that makes sense. At this point, it's the red player's turn. And since everyone else has already built a building, if they wanted to start an auction for any of these on the market, they would just instantly win them because nobody can outbid them. Now, instead of doing that, they've actually decided to add a building from their hand. It is worth noting, instead of doing either of these things, they could just pass and potentially close any stores if they wanted to, but they definitely want to add a building. In this case, they want to go with the antique store, and that has a cost of $6. So they can spend that to the bank. And at this point, all players have completed their building action. Now, the last thing that happens in the building phase is we have to refresh the building market. If no one built any of these four face-up public buildings, then all four of them would be discarded and we would get four more out. Although in this case, one was taken. So instead, only the single oldest of these buildings is going to be discarded. So this is going to be removed from the game. We can slide the rest of these down and then reveal another one on the top of the deck. All right, we can now move on to the advertisement phase. The way this works is each player can pick up their hand of five market cards, and we now need to play exactly two of these as supply or demand cards. Now on the player shield that we have in front of us, the left side says supply cards and the right side says demand cards. As I said, we do have to play two of these cards, so that means we could put two over here on the supply side, two on the demand side, or we could put one on each of these. Now, the card that we put on the supply area is going to go face up, as you can see, and the card on the demand side will go face down. Now, this phase happens simultaneously, so all of us are making this decision behind our screens, and once we are all happy, we will then reveal our screens to show the face-up supply cards. Now, the card that we put down for supply is going to indicate how many of that specific good is going to be added into the supplies on the board that can then be purchased by the players. Now, we are looking over here, and we can see that we can hold 5 plus 2, or 7 clothing total, and 2 food. Now, right at the moment, there are 6 clothing items over on the supply, so I feel like for the supply, we should put either this out to add 3 more, or this one, which will also add 3 more. Now, this will put a couple of electronics out, whereas this one will add a jewelry, and I think adding electronics is probably better in this case. Well, that's one card played, so we can put another one down into the supply, or we could put one down into the demand. Cards in the demand area will dictate how many of those specific goods the general public will be wanting to purchase from all of the players. Now, we are hoping to have a bunch of clothes, so I think it probably makes sense to put this one over there to make three demand for clothes, which gives us three options to sell. That does give an option to sell jewelry, I suppose, and both of our opponents can currently sell jewelry, whereas only one of them can sell electronics. So I think instead of this, let's go ahead and have this be our supply, and we can make this the demand. Either way, that's going to add three demand for clothing. Now that we have played two cards, we have three cards left in our hand, so we can now draw randomly from the top of the deck until we get back to our hand limit of five. Now that we are all done with our advertising decisions, we can remove our screens, and then at this point, all of the face-up cards are supply cards, so we can add all of these goods into the market. In this case, we will be adding three clothing and one jewelry. So we can place the jewelry here, and then the three clothing. Now the red player decided to add three food to the market, as well as two jewelry. And then finally, we can see the orange player decided to add four electronics and then one jewelry. Next up, all of the demand cards can be placed face down up here and no longer matters who actually put these cards down. Now, I would once again like to reiterate that as part of the advertisement phase, players could put multiple supply cards or multiple demand cards down. In this case, each of us decided to do one and one. Well, we can now move on to the supply phase, and in this phase, we are going to each potentially purchase these goods that are in the market. 
The way this works is we are going to start on the left and work our way to the right. So at the moment, we are purchasing food. Now, by we, I mean all of the players are purchasing food in this moment. And the way we purchase this food depends on whether or not the supply is constrained. The way we can figure that out is we count up the amount of the good in the supply. And in this case, there are seven food cubes here. And then we have to look at all of the player stores and count up the maximum amount of food that all players could collectively purchase this round. Now, the way that works is we can see a number on each store, which tells you the maximum amount of that good that store can take, no matter which of the shelves they are on. So that means the red player could purchase up to four food, and we could purchase up to two food. Now, the orange player is not in the food game so far, so that means up to six food can be purchased. Now, as we mentioned over here, there are seven food in the supply, so that means the supply is not constrained, so we can all simultaneously purchase food for the minimum purchase price. Now, it's worth noting that a good is not constrained if only one player could purchase that good, even if there is not enough of that good in the supply to meet that one player's maximum potential holding for that good. So we can purchase up to two food, and the minimum price is $1, and this is optional, but I think this is a fine thing for us to do. So we will purchase these two here and then spend $2 for it. And the red player is also going to purchase as much food as they can. And in this case, that is four food, which will once again cost them $1 each. So they can put a five back into the supply and take one back for their change. All right, we are now all done supplying food, so we can now move on to clothing. Now we have to once again to figure out if this is constrained. As you can see, there are currently nine of these clothing cubes in the supply, and if we look out to all of the player boards, the orange player could take up to four clothing, and we could take up to seven. So that means, all told, that is a maximum of 11 clothes that could be purchased. And since 11 is greater than 9, that means the supply is constrained. And before we can actually purchase this clothing, we now need to simultaneously decide how much we want to pay for them. The way this works is we can pick up our quantity and price dial, and since we are currently in the supply phase, which is the truck icon, we do not use the left dial. Now on the right, we have the price, and this is the amount that we are willing to pay for each clothing that we buy. Now, as you can see, the player who has the highest price is going to be the one who gets to purchase first. So that means if we go low, it's possible that uh, we would not be able to buy as many as we want to because other players will purchase them first. Now, the minimum price is $2, so we have to start with that. Now, in order to figure out how much we actually want to pay, we do have to look out here to see what our opponent wants to do. Obviously, the orange player is making this decision at the same time, and they can only stock up to four clothing from the market. Currently, there's nine over here, which would leave five left over. And you may have noticed on our clothing importer, it has a special ability that says if you stock five clothing in a supply phase, you get three victory points. Now, obviously, we want to do that. And fortunately for us, even if the orange player buys first, they could not take enough of these away to stop us from doing that. Now, one thing we could do is stick with the minimum price in order to take advantage of that. Or we could pay more in order to try and purchase first. Obviously, we can purchase up to seven clothes in front of us, and if we did that, then that would only leave two left in the supply. In that case, that would limit the amount that our opponent, the orange player, would be able to purchase, which is certainly something we want to consider. I suppose the last thing we need to consider is how much money we actually have. Uh, it looks like currently we have $19, and if we wanted to buy five of the clothing, at the minimum price, that would be $10. If we wanted to purchase five for $4 each, that would be $20, which we don't actually have in front of us. Now, we are allowed to take those debt tokens if we want to, but we can only buy up to one more good of each type within the round by taking those debt tokens. Now, that does not seem to make sense, so I don't think we should go with four. And if we wanted to buy these for three, that would be $15, and we could potentially buy another one over here. But I don't think that would really restrict our opponent enough, so let's just go with the cheap amount and play nice with our opponent. Now, they don't know that we're playing nice, which means they might decide they are happy paying more in order to make sure they can buy up to four clothing. Well, it looks like they've made their decision, so we can now reveal both of these. And they have decided to go with the minimum price of two. That means we are both trying to buy at the same price, but the supply is constrained. The way we break the tie is looking over here to the turn order track. As you can see, it has the icon for supply down on the bottom with an arrow pointing up. So that means the player lowest on this turn order track is going to have the tie broken in their favor. Now we are currently tied with the orange player, so that means we actually will break that tie and we can supply before the orange player can. 
Now that means we can spend $2 for each clothing that we want to buy, and we can purchase up to a maximum of seven clothing, which would cost us $14 total. Now we do have $14 in front of us, so I think let's go for it. Uh, we don't have any other goods that we could potentially buy. So we can spend this over to the bank, and we can take one back as our change. And then we can take the seven clothing we just purchased, and we are going to add them onto the top shelf in all of our applicable stores. Next up, as I pointed out before, the clothing importer has a special ability, and that ability shows the supply icon. That means this activates during the supply phase, and it says if you stock five clothing onto the store, you get three victory points. Now, obviously, you can only do this if you have no clothing in the store at all, which was the case for us. So we stocked five, and that means we can take our three points now. So we will go from 11 up to 14, and that means we get to move back into the first spot on the turn order track. Next up, Orange can purchase clothing at a rate of $2 each, and they have decided to just purchase one of these, so that is going to cost them $2. They certainly could have afforded to purchase another one at the moment, but it appears they are probably saving their money to try and purchase electronics, jewelry, or art later on in this phase. Alright, we can move on from clothing to electronics, and currently only one player can stock electronics, which means no matter how many are here in the supply or can be taken by the players, this is not constrained. Now, the orange player over here can purchase up to two electronics. And as you can see, they have a special benefit that happens during the supply phase. That says they spend two less dollars for every cube that they add down onto the duty-free store. This seems like a great deal for them, and they've decided to purchase two electronics. Normally that would be $4 each, but they have a $2 discount for each of these, so they can spend $4 total to take both. So they can add those over here, and they could not purchase any more electronics because they are capped out at two for that store. So they can spend their $4. And now it's time to purchase jewelry. As you can see, there are six jewelry cubes in the supply. And over here on the player's boards, they could purchase up to four. So that means this is not constrained. And there is a minimum price of $7 each for those. The red player can purchase up to three jewelry at their minimum cost, which is $7. And before they do that, I just realized that technically, we should be hiding how much money we have behind these screens. Now, at this point, the red player decides they would like to purchase three of this jewelry, so that means they need to spend $21. At the same time, Orange can buy up to one jewelry, and they do want to do that, and they get a discount of $2 at their duty-free, so they can do this by spending five of their dollars. At this point, we can move on to art. As you can see, there is two art in the supply, and players could hypothetically purchase up to three. That means this is constrained, so the players need to decide what price they would like to pay for this art. And then they can simultaneously reveal, and they both went with the minimum. Now, it's worth noting that the orange player does have a discount of two when they buy art into the duty-free store, but that discount comes after the set price they put up here. Now we can see that the red player can choose to buy first, but they've decided not to buy anything. Maybe they don't have enough money or they've just decided not to. And then after that, the orange player can purchase up to one art and they're also not going to buy any. So that means the supply phase has come to an end. This means we can move on to the sale phase of the round. And the first thing that we do is we flip over all of the market cards in the demand card area. Remember, these are the cards that the players decided would be dictating the demand for this round. And now it's time to sell goods. And just like the supply phase, we start at food and we work our way to the right. Now, the first thing that we have to do is check to see if the demand is constrained. The way this works is we can count up the amount of demand there is for food. And there are five of those icons. And then we can count the amount of that resource out on the player shops. As you can see, there is six food out here, which means food is constrained. Now, the way this works is each player who is in this, which is going to be us and red, are going to simultaneously decide not only what price we want to sell our food at, but also how many of that item we want to sell. Now, the amount that we decide is going to be the amount we are committing to lose whether or not we do successfully sell. It's worth noting the maximum price for food is $6, so we cannot set more than $6 on this track, and we can see that the person who bids the lowest amount for selling gets to sell first. So we have to choose our quantity. Obviously, that will be 0, 1, or 2, and it would be nice to sell both of this food if possible. So we could put a 2 there, and we can maybe go with $5 each so that we would make $10, although we do actually lose $2 each for every good we sell from our starting card because this just is not as good of a store.
So if we went with $5 each, that'd be five minus two or $3 each. So we'd only be making $6 total by selling these two back. We did buy them for $1 each, so they are still profitable for us. Uh, or we could just hedge our bets and stick with $6. Now, that would be a little risky. If our opponent went with $5 instead of our 6 they could sell all four of these, leaving just one spot left for our 2 and one of our food would go to waste. So I think what we should do is maybe just play a little conservatively and just set a quantity of 1 at $6, where we can be guaranteed we can sell that, and we could hopefully sell the other food in the next round of the game. Of course, while we are making this decision, the red player is also thinking about this. And after they've made their decision, we can flip these over. Now, it looks like they did decide to sell at a price of $5 compared to our 6 so that means they are going to sell first. They put their quantity of 4, so they were risking things a little bit if we had put our price down even more, but this is going to work out well for them. So they have to take all 4 because that is the quantity they said, and they can sell these by putting these cubes down onto the associated spots on these demand cards. After that, they are going to get $5 each, but they are going to lose $1 for every one of their food they sell from their starting building. So technically, they will get 5 minus 1, or 4, times 4, or $16 for selling their food. After that, we can sell, and because we did not push our luck, we are fine. We are only selling one of our food, but we'll get $6 minus 2, or $4 each. So we can place this right over here, and we did not lose this one. Once again, if we had set this to a 2, then in this case, that would be returned to the supply, and we wouldn't get anything for it. Alright, let's now move on to clothing. Currently, there are just three spots on the demand cards for people wanting to purchase clothing, and when we look out to all of the player stores, we have seven clothing, and the orange player has just one. So this is certainly constrained, and that means we need to decide the quantity and price that we want to sell for the clothing. Now, the maximum price for clothing is $8 each. And we now have a difficult decision to make. Obviously, we have a ton of clothing over here, and the orange player has one. And that might not seem like a lot, but one is one-third of the overall clothing demand that is available in this round. Now, you can look down here and see that we currently have seven clothes, but we are not allowed to set a quantity that is higher than the current demand on these cards or the demand showing up on fulfillment centers. And I'll explain how these fulfillment centers work later on in the tutorial. That means the biggest number we can put here is going to be 3, and if we did that along with the max value of 8, I think odds are pretty good that we would not be able to sell all 3 of that clothing. Uh, the reason for that is because currently we are losing the tiebreaker when it comes to selling our goods, and obviously the orange player can't go higher than 8 either. Now one thing we could do is keep our price at 8, but then put our quantity down to 2, that way we are guaranteed to sell both of those for $16 total. Now, the reason we might not want to do that is because we are pretty incentivized to try and clear off our clothing importer. Remember, we get three points every time we stock five clothes onto it, and the only way to do that is by having the clothing importer be empty at the start of the round. Now, another obvious option that we have is to lower our price. Now, we could go down to seven or even six, and I think what we should do is go with a price of six and a quantity of three. That way we can be trying to clear out our clothing importer as quickly as possible while still hopefully being able to sell all three of them at this lower price point. We are hoping that the orange player is a little bit greedier than that and that they decide to go higher, not expecting us to go so low. Uh, they might be assuming we would just sell two, but we are going to try and sneak in and sell three. Now, of course, while we are making this decision, so is the orange player. Once Orange has made their decision, they've decided to sell one at a rate of $5, so they did go even lower than we expected. Now, we have a price of $6, so that means Orange does get to sell first. They can place this over here, and they are going to get 5 minus 2 for their starting billing penalty, or just $3 for selling that clothing. Uh, they actually spent $2 buying it, so they've made a $1 profit with that exchange. Now, after that, we can sell up to three of ours, and we will get $6 each. We don't have any penalties associated with our clothing importer in the selling phase, so we can see that there is room for two of our clothing. That means we will get two times six, or $12. And unfortunately, we were just a little bit too optimistic, and this third clothing is going to be returned back to the supply. All right, we are done with clothing, and it's now time to sell electronics. Now, surprisingly enough, there is a ton of demand for electronics. Uh, it looks like up to five cubes could be sold, 
but currently there are just two cubes on any of the player buildings. That means this is not constrained, so the orange player up here can sell both of these, and those will fill these slots in, and since it's not constrained, they will get the maximum amount of money for those, which is $12 each. So just by doing that, they are going to make $24, and they are feeling pretty good about being an electronic salesperson in February. Next up, jewelry can be sold, and currently there are four pieces of jewelry out here on player buildings, but there is no jewelry over here in the demand. So it's so constrained that no one can sell any of their jewelry, so we can move right on to art. Now there is a single art demand over here, and currently no players actually purchased art. It is relatively expensive overall, and that means no one can sell in order to meet that demand of one. This means we have come to the end of the sale phase, so now what we do is we return all of the cubes from the demand cards back to the supply, and all of the demand cards themselves will be put here into a discard pile. Alright, we can now move into the inventory phase. The way this works is every player will lower all of their goods in their stores down by one shelf. So as you can see, these will go down here, and these will go over there, and once again, these numbers are the maximum number of cubes you could have, no matter what shelf they are on. So that means our starting building is still maxed out on clothing, even though this is on the bottom shelf. Now, if by doing an inventory phase, these go down onto no shelf, then these cubes are returned to the supply, and it is worth noting that sometimes you can actually get victory points for that. For example, you can see this pawn shop says that when your cubes expire, you may return them to the market instead of putting them back to the supply, and then you get two victory points for every one that you return. So sometimes you actually want your goods to expire. Speaking of benefits from lowering your goods on the inventory phase, we can see that the red player has this antique store, and it says during the sale phase, they actually lose $5 for every cube they sell from their top shelf, and they gain $5 more per cube that they sell from their third shelf. Now, if they sell from their fourth shelf, which is the bottom one, they will get four points for every cube that they sell. So they were investing in the future by taking these three jewelry right here. They obviously did not want to sell them in this round because that would be a minus five money per. And now they want to wait until this gets to at least the third shelf to get a large monetary benefit. Or maybe they'll push their luck by waiting till these are on the bottom shelf to try and get an extra four points each if they sell. Finally, Orange can do their inventory phase as well. It's worth noting this phase can happen simultaneously amongst all of the players. Well, it's now time to move on to the utilities phase. The way this works is we have to add up the utility cost on all of our buildings, plus any cost listed in the top right on our storefront. So we can see we pay $0 for our starting building, but our clothing importer is $2 plus another $1 in utilities for this storefront. So that means we have to spend $3 in utilities. And of course, if we did not have enough money to pay for this, we would have to take debt tokens until we could. Next up, we can see the red player owes 3 plus 1 or $4. So they can pay that to the bank. And finally, the orange player also owes $4. That will be easily paid by them, and as you can see, as you get more storefronts, the base utility cost is going to go up for each new one. Well, utilities are done, so we can now move into the final phase of the round, which is called investment. This means in player order starting at the top and going down, we can spend money in order to get victory points. Now, the more points we buy in one round, the less efficient we get with the money, so that is certainly something to keep in mind. Another obvious thing to keep in mind is any money we spend right now on victory points will be money we do not have in order to purchase supplies as well as new buildings in the next round of the game. Now it looks like we currently have $15, and it's worth noting you are not allowed to take debt tokens when purchasing points. Well, we are one money away from buying three points, but that would probably be an awful idea. Now we could spend nine of our dollars in order to get two points, but that would leave us with only five dollars going into the next round, which does not sound very good. Um, so realistically, we should either spend our four dollars or maybe just no money at all. Uh, the game is still relatively early and we are in the lead, so I think let's just not buy any points at this moment. Now it's worth noting that instead of buying points, we could actually sell points. Now, when you sell points, you are going to get $3 each for every point that you sell, no matter how many, and you can sell as many points as you want to, all the way down to zero. Now, the reason you might do this is to get more money immediately, as well as to potentially manipulate the turn order track to put you into a spot that you like better. When you consider the best return for buying points is $4 for one point, and selling gets you $3 for that point, it does not seem like a great idea to sell a bunch. 
Now we could maybe consider selling one of our points right now in order to have a little bit more money to buy stuff, but we do already have a pretty decent supply of things. So in the next round, maybe we'll just try to play some of these cards out in order to liquidate our food as well as our clothing. Although unfortunately, we only have one card that lets us sell clothing and that's what we have the most of. Either way, I think let's just hold on to our money for now, and that means the orange player can now decide how many points to buy. After considering their options, they are not going to be selling, they are going to be buying, and they want to spend $9 in order to purchase two more points, which means they are tied with us, and that means that the turn order track does not change. And lastly, the red player can decide if they want to buy or sell points, and they've decided that they are going to hold on to their money right now and not purchase any. All right, the investment phase is over, and that means the month of February has come to an end. Now, at the end of a month, if it is not the end of December, then we move this to the top, and we proceed on to the following month, which is March. Now, the way the game ends is if we go through all 12 of these months, or if at any point during a round, any player reaches the victory point threshold, which in a three-player game is 45 points. Now, if a player reaches this, then this is removed, and if that player ends up going down below that, then the end game will still be triggered, and we could then go into final scoring. Now, I will describe how final scoring works soon, but at this point, I'm going to play through one more month. In this case, that is going to be the month of March. So if you'd like to see how final scoring works, then go to the timestamp in the top right corner, and if not, then stick around, and we can go through all seven phases one more time. Well, we are starting things off with the building phase, and it looks like we get to do that first. Now, we currently have $14, and we have these two buildings in our hand. We could build this electronics distributor for $8, and that has a sell phase ability that says if you sell at least two cubes, you may earn three victory points instead of getting money for each additional electronics that we would sell. So that is really beneficial if you sell a bunch of electronics all at once. The other card we have is Thrift Store. This says that during the sell phase, we would lose five money for every cube that we sell, which is obviously not good at all. But down here, it says at the end of the sale phase, with that arrow on the end, it says you may transfer cubes to here, and you get one victory point for every cube that you transfer. Now, when you transfer, that means you simply move them from one of your businesses onto another. So that means we could hypothetically just transfer stuff onto here to get those points and then obviously get a lot less money when we sell them. But getting those points would still be a good thing for us. Now, these are the options we have in our hand, but we also have all four of these options out here. If we want to buy one of these, then we will have to start an auction. So let's take a look and see what these options are. This art liquidator says that when you close this store, you immediately get three victory points for every cube that you discard, obviously up to two cubes because this can hold up to two art. So this one is interesting. You're kind of motivated to try and get rid of this entire building uh, as soon as you have those two cubes there to get the six points. Next up, we have a fulfillment center, and this is a special type of building. You can see here it shows in the sale phase, you may sell up to three food here. Now this functions essentially like a private demand card just for that one type of good. So that means if we had this, then we could sell the food from our starting card directly onto our fulfillment center and not have to worry about demand cards for that food, or at least for the first three of that food. Now this clears out at the end of the sale phase, just like the demand cards. Moving on, there is the large loading dock, and this one doesn't actually hold any cubes at all. It says during the supply phase, you get minus one, minus two, or minus three dollars for every cube that you buy whenever you stock at least two, four, or five cubes, all of the same type, into your stores. So this gives a nice monetary benefit for purchasing large blocks of cubes at once. That one is certainly of interest to me, considering we already have a store that gives us a benefit for stocking five clothing onto it at the same time. The last building we could start an auction for is the freezer. Now this one is special. It says during the supply phase, you cannot stock into the store. And it says during the sell phase, you get one victory point for every food that you sell from the freezer. And as you can see, the freezer can hold up to five food. Now you do not collect any money for those cubes that you sell. You just get the victory points. After that, we can see this arrow at the end of the sale icon, which means at the end of the sale phase, you may transfer food to here or from here onto other businesses of yours. You may not transfer the same food more than once per month. Finally, it says down here during the inventory phase, items do not expire, so you do not move them down onto any other shelves. The last thing of note here is that the utility cost for the freezer is $1 for every food cube that you have down here at the time. Well, there are some good options available to us, and I think let's start an auction for this large loading dock. 
That does synergize well with our clothing and porter, and the sooner we get these discounts in play, the more money we hypothetically make later on. Now, the starting bid for that is $6, and we know that we currently have just $14 in front of us. That means if we go for 6 and nobody else outbids us, we will still have $8 left over, which would be enough to purchase some clothes or food if we want. Now, this does seem like a good card, so I think let's increase our starting bid by 1, so we are going to say we start the bid off at 7 for the large loading dock. So the orange player can potentially outbid us, and they've decided not to, they are going to pass, and then the red player can, and they are also going to pass. So maybe it's a good thing we decided to spend $7 instead of 6 or maybe 6 would have been fine, but either way, we have one with a bid of $7, so we now have to pay that. We can put 10 in the bank and take 3 back as change, and now we can add this onto our board. Now, as you can see, that has a utility cost of 2 plus 2 more for the board, but we have also unlocked a new ability that's printed here on our storefront. That symbol is for the advertisement phase, and once you have a building on this third spot, you may discard one or all of your current market cards in order to draw replacements. Now, if you have all four buildings filled up here, you get another ability that says you may play an extra market card during the advertisement phase, which means you would play three cards instead of the normal two. All right, our turn is done, so we have to refill the market, and the next card on the top of the deck is the Electronics Peddler. Now, that says that during the uh, supply phase, you spend three less for every electronics you buy, and this can hold up to six, which is pretty significant. It also says that during the sell phase, you make three more dollars for every electronics you sell, and you must close this store immediately after a sale of one or more electronics. So it makes sense, I guess, to get up to six and then try to sell all of them as quickly as you can, because obviously the store will then close. Finally, down here, it says that the cost to buy this is minus four dollars for every electronic store opened by any other opponents. All right, the orange player can now do their build phase and they've decided to build a card from their hand. In this case, they would like to build the food bank, and that is going to cost them $8. Next up, they can add that into the third spot on their storefront, so they also gain this advertisement ability, and we can see the food bank right here says that at the end of the food part of the supply phase, you may stock any remaining food from the supply onto the store for $0 each. So obviously this works out well when there is a food surplus in the supply. Lastly, the red player can do their build phase, and they've decided they're actually going to pass on buying a building. Uh, they don't have a lot of money back over here, and they've decided they want to invest more into the benefits of their antique store, which obviously is going to require a decent amount of money as well. Now, they could, when they manage in this phase, close one of their stores, but they've decided that they're not going to do that yet. They still like this starting building here, so they are just fully passing on doing anything during their building phase. Since the building phase is over, we can now get rid of the oldest card from the market. Remember, if none of these cards were taken, then we would get rid of all four of them. So this will be returned to the box. We can slide these down, and then one more building will be revealed. This is a fulfillment center, which lets you sell up to two electronics onto it each round of the game. All right, let's now move into the advertisement phase. This means we have to play two cards out, and I think the first thing that we should do is get rid of this card right here by using our ability printed on the third storefront. It says we can discard one or all of our market cards to draw replacements, and I am pretty okay with our other cards. I guess if we got rid of all five, we would potentially draw into multiple cards that have clothing as a demand, but we already have one of these, so I think we should hold on to it. So we will discard this and then draw one more from the top of the deck, and it does technically have one more clothing printed on there. Now, at this point, we have to decide which of these we want to put out. We can put them down for supply and demand or a mix of both. And at the moment, if we look at our money, we have $7 total. Now, with that, we could potentially buy some goods. And since we have a loading dock, we are motivated to buy at least two in this round. Now, we are also motivated to try and sell our clothes. So part of me feels like maybe we just put this down and that down over there for demand. Uh, that means that would be four demand for clothing, which is good, as well as a bunch of demand for food. We might buy another food, which would let us uh, sell that to get another profit going on for us. I think let's go for this. There's quite a few cubes out there in the supply already. that I'm not sure what my opponents are going to do. But right now, let's put both of these down as demand cards and wait for them to be done. 
Of course, at this moment, we have to refill our hand size so we can draw both of these and put those on top of our hand. It looks like they happen to be the same. It looks like we are all ready, so we can remove the screens. And both of our opponents played one supply and one demand card. Now we can take all of these supply cards, and it looks like there are just two. And then, of course, there are four demand cards. So we can place these face down into the demand area on the board. And then, of course, we have to add all of this to the supply. Interestingly enough, they are the same card. So that means there will be six food added into the market, and then two more jewelry. All right, we can now move on to the supply phase. And we can start by purchasing food. Now, the constraint in the market is seven food total. And then out here, it looks like we could buy one, the red player could buy four, and the orange player could buy five. So that is a total of 10 to the seven. So this is constrained. And all three players now have to decide what price they want to pay for that food. Now, realistically for us, we can only purchase one food total. And of course, the quantity doesn't matter when we're in the supply phase. And the minimum price for food is $1. Now, if we decide to pay more than that, then we have a higher chance of actually getting that food. But considering we are only taking one, I don't think we should go too crazy. Currently, we have $7 total, and it would be really good to purchase two clothes in order to leverage the benefit we get from our large loading dock. And the minimum price for clothing is $2. So I think we are in a pretty good spot. We could pay up to $3 each for those. Of course, then there is the discount of the loading dock, which would be $1 if we bought two clothes later on. I think overall spending $2 for a food seems pretty good considering the max uh, selling price for it is $6, so I think we'll still make money with that. So we'll go with this, and now we can reveal what our opponents want to do. The red player wants to pay just $1 each for the food, and the orange player is doing the same. That means our $2 is more than theirs, and that means we get to buy first. Of course, we only have space for one, so we can purchase this and put it into our starting building for $2. And obviously that will go down onto our top shelf. Next up, red and orange are tied, and we can see that red is lower on the turn order track, and that means they get to break the tie because this is the supply phase where we go from the bottom up. So that means they can buy up to their maximum in food for $1 each, and they could take four food, and that is what they have decided to do. So they have to spend $4, and now the orange player can purchase. And we can see there is two food left over here, and they could take up to five. Now, they could buy those two food for $1 each, or they could decide to not buy any food at all, which is what they're going to do, because at the end of the food part of the supply phase, their food bank will activate, which says they can stock any remaining food onto this door for $0 each. So that means they can just take whatever is left over up to five, so they can place these right over here, and they've effectively saved themselves $2, because that is the price per cube that they had set. All right, we can now move on to clothing. There is just one clothing cube out here right now, and I've just come to the realization that this is a problem with my plan of trying to buy at least two clothes to take advantage of our large loading dock. Well, we didn't make sure that there was actually enough clothing out here to buy, so it is impossible to actually pull that off because there's only one out here. Now, obviously, we could take three more, and we can see that the orange player can take four, so this is very much constrained, and the minimum price per clothing is $2. Now we know that we put two cards into the demand stack, which would let up to four clothing be sold, but we don't know if either of our opponents also put cards into there, which let clothing be sold. Now if they did, then potentially we could sell all five of our resources. Right now we are mostly hoping to sell all four of these. Now one interesting thing is the fact that if we took this clothing, then neither of our opponents would have any, which means we could sell all of our clothes for the max price because this would not be constrained. Uh, we would not have to worry about figuring out how much the orange player wants to sell theirs at. So it's almost better for us to go a little bit high to try and buy this in order to quarter the market for this round. Of course, they might go higher, but that would, of course, involve them spending even more money. And we can tell that they probably want to buy electronics as well as potentially art, and both of those cost even more money than clothing. So in this case, I think let's set our price all the way up to four, which does seem like quite a lot, but I really would like to corner the market this round. Our orange opponent has made their decision, and they wanted to buy for $3 each, which is of course less than our four, so that means this has been a successful gambit for us. We can purchase this clothing, and we do have to spend $4, and we had $5, so we can still afford this with just $1 left in the bank. 
Unfortunately, because we only bought one of a good instead of at least two, we don't get the discounts from our large loading dock just yet, but I'm sure this card would be quite good as we went on through the game. Well, it's now time for electronics to be purchased, and currently the orange player is the only one who can buy any electronics. Now, they get a discount of two if they buy to their duty-free, which is the only spot they can take electronics, and that means they can pick up each of these for four minus two, or just two dollars each. Now, that is what they have decided to do, so that will be four dollars total. And they can do that by returning this five to the bank, and they can take one back as change. Moving on, jewelry can now be purchased. Now, at the moment, actually no player can purchase any because all of the jewelry stores are at their max capacity, so we can just move on to art. Now, there are two of the art goods currently in the supply, and it looks like the orange player could take one and the red player could take two, so this is constrained, and they now need to decide how much they want to pay for art. It's worth noting that the minimum value is 10, and we can now see that both players have put $10 up. With that tie, that means red gets to go first, and they are going to pass on purchasing this art. At this point, they are kind of kicking themselves. They think maybe they should not have bought all of this food, which would have let them have enough money to purchase one of these art, which will then slowly work its way down the antique store, getting better, but that is not the decisions that they made. And of course, any food they did not buy would have been gifted over to the orange player into their food bank for free, so that was certainly a consideration. Uh, that means that the orange player can now purchase one art, but they are going to pass on that as well. It looks like they also don't have the money for it, even with their $2 discount. So we can now move into the sale phase, and that means we can reveal all of the demand cards. Now that is a lot of food demand overall, and a bunch of jewelry demand as well, and it looks like neither of our opponents put in any more demand for clothing. Well, we can start by selling food, and the current demand is 9. Out here on player shops, there are eight cubes, so that is less than the nine for demand, so this is not constrained, and we can all sell as much food as we want to up to our maximum, and we can charge $6 each. Well, let's start with ourselves. We have two food, and we do have a penalty of $2 for each that we sell from our starting building. So that means each of these will be worth six minus two, or $4, so those two will give us $8. Next up, the red player is going to sell all four of those, and they have a minus one penalty, so that means each is going to be worth $5, and that means they are going to get $20 for selling that food. Finally, the orange player has two food up here, and they've decided they are going to sell it. There is no penalty over here, so they can get $6 each. Those will go right down over there, and there's still one demand left open in this round. So they can take their $12. And it's now time to sell clothing. Now, at this moment, we are the only ones with any clothing, and we tried to make that happen by spending a decent amount for that one clothing that we purchased this round. So that means we are not constrained, even though we have more clothing cubes than there are spots out here on the demand. So we can sell up to the maximum demand amount for the maximum value. So that means let's definitely sell all three of these. So that is $8 each times three or $24. And then we can sell this and it has a minus two penalty on it. So this is going to give us $6. So all told, we just made $30 by selling all of those clothes. And at this moment, we have just one cube left on all of our storefronts. Next up, electronics can be sold, and currently there is no demand for it, so that means even though the orange player is the only one with electronics, they cannot sell these on this turn. So we can now move on to jewelry. There is a ton of demand this round. It looks like six demand total, and there are four jewelry goods out here on the market, so this is not constrained, and players can sell their jewelry for the max value of $18 each if they want. Well, the orange player is definitely going to be doing this, so that is going to give them $18. And at the same time, the red player could sell, but they've decided they are not going to. There is easily enough demand for this jewelry, but if they wait one more round, then all three of these will be worth five more dollars each when sold. If they wait one more round after that, then instead of the extra money, they get four extra points for each one sold, so they definitely want to continue investing time into these to try and get a bigger payout later on in the game. Finally, we can check art. There is currently no art on any markets, and there's also no demand for art, so that was a quick one. None is going to be sold this round. Well, the sale round is done, so we can clear off all cubes from these demand cards, and of course, if anyone had any fulfillment centers, now would be the time those would be cleared off as well. Next up, it's time to manage our inventory. 
This means every cube needs to be lowered down one shelf, and unfortunately we were not able to liquidate this clothing before it expired. So this is going to drop off the shelf and then be returned back to the supply, and we have officially lost that money that we invested in that good. Next up, the red player can lower all three of this jewelry, so now they are up for one of the penalties if they were to sell next round. Again, if they waited another round, these could be worth a ton of points, as long as there is demand for them to be sold. Of course, if they risk that, it's possible that they might not sell all of them, and then these would expire, which would send them back to the supply. Finally, the orange player can lower their electronics. It looks like there was no demand for them, and if they don't sell these next round, then these are going to disappear. After that, it's time to pay our utility bills. It looks like we currently owe $7 total, so we can pay that over to the bank. Next up, Red just owes $4 because they are the only ones who did not put another building onto their storefront this round. Lastly, it looks like Orange owes $8 total for their utilities, and they can also easily pay that. Alright, it's time for the final phase of March, which is investment. This means we can all buy or sell points, and we do this in player order, so we go first. Now currently, it looks like we have $32 available to us into the next round, and with that in mind, I think maybe let's hedge our bets a bit and spend $9 in order to purchase two points. It is a good idea to purchase points whenever you can in these rounds, because again, the lower amount of points you buy, the better your return on the money. So if you don't end up buying any points in a round like we did last time, that certainly isn't a good thing in the long run. Either way, this round we did spend nine money, so we can take our two points, which brings us up to 16. Next up, the orange player can go, and they want to spend $4, which will purchase them a single victory point. And finally, red can go, and they are also going to spend just $4. They have a ton of capital wrapped up in the jewelry in their antique store, so they figure they'll probably buy a bunch of points soon once they liquidate those. But for now, they are still a little bit lean when it comes to cash on hand. So that is going to give them one point, and it looks like the player order did not change. Well, March is over, and no one reached the endgame threshold of 45 points, so this could move to the top, and it would now be the start of April, but at this point, I am now going to stop playing through the game. It's now time to talk about what happens once the game is over, which again will happen at the end of December, or at the end of any round where any player reached the victory point threshold at least at some point during that round. Now, once that happens, it will then be time to calculate our final scores. The way this works is we add up all of the points that are in the bottom left corner of the buildings in our storefront, and it's worth noting that they are not always positive. For example, this electronics peddler is worth a negative one point at the end of the game if you still have them in front of you. Now in this case, for an example, we currently have 13 points worth of buildings, but then you reduce points for each empty storefront. As you can see, that is going to be minus one point for each of the empty spots, so at this moment we have 13 minus one, or 12 points in buildings in front of us. Now, obviously, the game isn't over just yet, so I'm not going to track these points, but let's go ahead and see what our opponent's building scoring looks like at the moment as well. The red player currently has positive 5 points and a negative 2 in penalties, so that's 3 points for buildings. And up here, the orange player looks like they have positive 11 points minus 1, which would be 10 points right now. The final thing that we have to do as part of final scoring is lose points for each of our debt tokens. Remember, every $2 that you take is going to lose you one point, and there are larger tokens like this to show if you had taken $10 in debts, that is going to lose you five points once the game is over. Now, it's worth noting that during the entire final scoring, the turn order does not change, and once we have added up all of these things, the player with the most points is going to be the winner, and if there is a tie, then the player who is farthest up on this track is going to be the one who breaks the tie in their favor. Well, at this point, I have now covered just about all of the rules to the game, which means this tutorial has come to a close. I hope you've enjoyed learning how to play Brick and Mortar. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you would like to directly support the channel and the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongusgamescom support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.